Hello, and welcome to the Sands Cloud Ace podcast. I'm extremely excited to have with us here today, Rinki Sethit, who is currently the CISO at Bill and was previously the CISO at Twitter. And you know, we'll get into all of uh, Rinki's background here, um, as well, all of the other amazing companies that you've been at. But Rinki, thanks a lot for joining. Frank, thanks for having me. All right, great. Well, hey, with that, let's go ahead and dive right in. You know, the uh, I like to start these uh, these uh, episodes here with a little bit of personal background. And you had previously shared with me just a little bit about the influence that your dad had on you. Can you share a little bit about your personal and family history and how did that perhaps influence your choice of career? Yes. Yeah, so I was born and raised um, in the Bay Area by immigrant parents. Um, you know, education was a really, really strong focus in our household. Um, and I was lucky in some ways that um, my dad was an early adopter of technology uh, from like the time I could remember. I grew up when I was a little a little baby uh, and there's pictures of me in his lap using a, la a, a computer and um, exposed. I think I was doing something on the keyboard um, and so exposed to computers at a very early age. Um, and that continued and my interest with computers continued um, in, in, you know, he continued to foster that too. He was one of the early teachers uh, of Java and other programming language that languages that had come out. Um, but when I was starting to get into the high school age, there was an app called AOL Instant Messenger. Um, and we all used to chat with our friends uh, on that. And it was kind of this new hot thing. Well, my dad caught on pretty quick and thought we were wasting a lot of time and was wondering, I guess, what we were doing on there. And so one day I overhear him talking to my mom about something that I had privately chatted with one of my friends about. And so I was like, he has something on my machine. And I found that he had parental spyware or a keylogger on my machine. Um, I uninstalled it. I told my sister, hey, watch out. He's got <laughs> parental, he's got some kind of spyware. And then he would go back and install it again. And so I was like, I don't have time for this. I wrote a program to catch the pro make sure I caught any time he installed that spyware and would remove it from my laptop. And I gave that to my sister as well. Um, and I think that's kind of where my hacker mindset, I, I realized I have a little bit of let's I'm figuring out how to work around systems. Um, and I went and did a computer science engineering degree, um, not knowing what I would do next, probably assuming I would be a developer, but somehow landed my first job out of college um, accidentally into cybersecurity. That is very cool. So a lot of uh, interesting touch points that you mentioned. You know, I'm also originally from the San Francisco Bay Area, and you know, you don't necessarily see a lot of Bay Area natives of our of our generation. So that's very cool. You know, I also have an immigrant family as well. And you know, I don't know about you, but growing up, all my parents was kind of stereotypical. They always talked about, uh, hey, you know, you got to be a doctor or a lawyer and kind of a tech job or a cybersecurity. You know, didn't even exist back in the day. You know, were they specifically saying similar things for you as well? Oh, yeah. Mine was even more narrow. It was become a doctor or an engineer. When I said I wanted to be a lawyer, it was like, well, that's your second degree. What's your first degree going to be in? And so it was very specific on it's got to be some kind of engineering or you're going to go into medical school. And I knew that path medical school was not for me. So it was engineering, but absolutely the same mindset. That is too funny. Hey, well, at least, you know, you got the lesson in aiming high from an early age. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's very cool that you played a little bit of kind of hacker cat and mouse game with uh with your dad back in the day. You know, you know, kind of effectively creating your own uh, anti malware uh, even at an early age. That is so cool. Yeah, it was a uh, yeah. I I definitely got some exposure. So you could say my dad influenced me in certain ways, and certain ways made it you know made me figure out how to how to bypass some of the tools that we had on there. Yeah, you know, my, my first job out of school was also as a developer, and I had actually no idea what I necessarily wanted to get into. But, you know, given your kind of the roots of how you got into security, can you walk us through a little bit about kind of how you started your career, where you started your career, and kind of the, the path that you've taken up until now? Yeah, and I'll try to make it brief. So I um, graduated from college at a really bad time. It was after the dot-com bust that happened. There weren't that many jobs. Most of my friends in college were going and getting their master's degree or figuring out what they were going to do next. Um, I happened to go to a recruiting night with one of my friends, and it was with PG&E, and &E, and um, they were recruiting on our campus at UC Davis. And I wasn't being recruited, but I was like, Free pizza, I'll go. Um, and they had a, and, and I just started talking to one of the hiring managers that happened to be there. And he asked me, what's your favorite class you're taking? And I said, cryptography. And he said, wow, are you, who are you taking the class with? And I mentioned the professor's name and he said, oh, 
I know that I know that professor and he wrote one of the first textbooks for colleges in that uh, subject. And so he's like, I'd love to interview you for this job we have in information protection. And I was like, I'll take any, any interview at that point. I didn't know what it meant. I interviewed. Um, I was probably one of like 50 kids that was interviewing for that position, ended up getting the job. Um, and that was my entrance into what we now call cybersecurity. And um, I got my first job there. So I worked at pg e for about, I think it was two or three years. Um, I was an analyst. Uh, I did some engineering work. Um, I realized I didn't know much about security. So I started studying um, and got my master's degree online in information security. I started that at PG&E. I started getting some certifications and just learning what information security was about. And I decided that I needed to, given that I had a, this computer science engineering degree, I needed to go back to my engineering roots. So I started looking for a role where I would be much more technical engineer. And I happened to get a role at walmart.com. I uh, did security engineering there. I found my passion in cybersecurity while I was there and had a really good mentor that helped kind of show me the ropes and everything to do with uh, information security, everything from how do you do a vulnerability scan? How do you do a pen test? What is application security? Why is security training important? I learned everything there. Um, I had my first child when I was there and then decided I needed to find a job that was closer to home. And so that took me to eBay. Um, I went to eBay to drive security culture change um, and, you know, rules change. They had me do several things, but that's where my career really took off. Um, I was a chief of staff for the security organization. I ran several teams in security. And then um, I had my second child and was looking for a change. I went to Intuit to be a security business partner. Um, three months after I joined, they said, Ricky, we want you to take over the product security team. We want to transform how we do security as we move not just to the cloud, but to public cloud, moving data uh, from TurboTax and other products that they sold into uh, public cloud into AWS. So I helped with that transformation um, and then was there for a few years before moving to Palo Alto Networks. Um, I ran security operations at Palo Alto Networks, built it from scratch, scaled it, uh, made it something that customers could come and see. Um, and then made a little bit of a career mistake. I went to IBM. I was there for six months before I took on my first uh, job as uh, chief information security officer at Rubric, um, which was a startup, which is a startup company um, that's just uh, booming right now and um, was there, helped them start their entire security program globally. Um, and then COVID hit and things had to scale back a little bit. And I was looking for another challenge. So I took on the role uh, of CISO at Twitter uh, during a very interesting time right after they had the security breach, right before the U.S. election. Um, and then I left right before uh, the acquisition uh, had happened um, and joined Bill. And I've been at Bill for the last year and a half, leading both IT and security. Um, and in in those in the last five, six years, I would say um, I've, I've also joined a couple boards. I sit on the board of Forge Rock. I got to uh, be there in their journey to go public. Um, and now they're on their journey to go private again. Um, and then I also sit on the board of Vault Tree um, and, and advise a dozen security startups or so. So that's been um, a highlight too. Uh, you know, it's, it's fun to do the security work. I'm very passionate about it, but some of the board work and all of that has definitely enhanced, um, you know, just my experience. Wow, that's an incredible career journey. Thanks a lot for sharing that. You know, you worked at, uh, had a number of great experiences, worked at a number of amazing uh, organizations there and kind of going all the way from analyst back in the day to a uh, C multi-time CISO now. So that is a very cool, uh, very cool journey. And, uh, you know, we first met, uh, you know, when you were uh, at Intuit uh, back some years ago. And, um, you know, I remember, you know, it was around that time that cloud was first, uh, you know, kind of coming to the forefront here. And certainly now today, everyone, organization pretty much is in cloud to some degree. And uh, cloud is a lot more well understood here. And so kind of based on what you've seen from your previous roles and even where you are today, you know, how did you build that cloud security expertise, not only for yourself, but for your team members as well? Yeah. Um, first of all, I didn't realize it's been a decade, Frank, since I've known you. <laughs> and that, um, it, uh, it, it went by fast. Um, it was really interesting, you know, when I took over uh, this team around product security, um, there was almost a resistance to like resistance to change, right? Like folks were wanting to do security the same way that they understood it at the time. And so there you were, I'm everybody's starting to learn about AWS and AWS was not back then what it is today. <laughs> and their capabilities around security were so different. Um, and for them to take on a company like Intuit at that time was so early for them, right? So 
now it doesn't it see it feels like things have just completely transformed in 10 years but um there was a real mindset shift needed in the folks that were in the security org on you need to rethink things like the cloud how you architect apps how you think about security how you can bake in security earlier on and why that's even more important than ever all required a mindset and culture change um and people that wanted to learn and innovate and do things differently um and so that was that was a really interesting journey to go through it was very challenging um because how do you change culture um in a team and and you can't execute on what you need to do until you can build that in first um now a decade from now it's still like many companies I being at rubric and listening to our customers or Palo Alto networks um, and now even at bill we're early in our cloud journey but it's there's still companies that are still early in their journey into cloud um, but now cl that's uh, in such a more mature state and there's so many solutions out there on how and and advice on how to do it right um but it, and then many companies I think we're into it was about 10 years ago many companies are going through that journey right now um, and it's really interesting to see. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned uh, Palo Alto, which is, of course, a well-known leader in security. You know, mentioned Rubrik, you know, with a focus on zero trust and those kind of emerging capabilities, if you will. You know, kind of from a, if you take a step back from a big picture perspective, how do you tend to think about your overall cloud security capabilities, your security architecture, especially as it relates to cloud? Yeah, I think like you mentioned it, I think that zero trust, um, you know, and it's become this buzzword now, but like, how do you make sure that, um, you verify, you you know, and and make sure that you're building that kind of, you're on that journey of zero trust, and especially because you're no longer, everything's no longer within your own perimeters, which is exactly how it was when I was in, when I started my career, right? If you wanted to go use, get into your data center, you had VPN, but again, that was in your own network. Now things have just completely changed. Um, having worked at different types of companies, especially I think when the pandemic hit, you could see which companies just it was like no change. You just go home and work instead of working in the office. And it's because these companies that were bo born cloud first, that had all SaaS applications, didn't have their own data centers. And it was like they had built already for a remote world, um, whereas other companies really struggled. They did, they were like, oh, my gosh, now where our employees are going to go home. We have no visibility and in, into anything. And so you're starting to think about that zero trust journey um a little bit later and it was a little bit more of a struggle but i think now as companies build in this hybrid world that we live in um you're thinking about that from the very inception of the company right where it's how do you build in a in a way where it's zero trust how do you build that right from the beginning yeah exactly in terms of kind of these uh principles and these modern engineering practices you know you you mentioned earlier kind of the the mindset and being able to shift the culture overall i've had numerous uh friends and colleagues in security in years past say you know hey frank i just i hate devops you know it's just a reason excuse for developers to have root access in production which you know couldn't be further from the truth right that's an indication of a lack of understanding of how things actually work and, uh, you know, in terms of, you mentioned another keyword earlier in terms of uh, mentorship, you know, how do you start to guide people in the right direction? How do you shift that culture overall? What are some kind of tactical, practical things that have worked for you over the years? I think data always helps, right? When you go in and you try to change a culture and you're trying to say, you have to, you know, you have to do this because it's important. Uh, and, and folks will say, oh yeah, yeah. But it's like, that's not going to happen to us. Like a breach is not going to happen to us. This isn't going to happen to us. I think you have to show them, right? Um, I found a lot of success in a, in a, in a couple of ways. One, of course, like sharing with them, like if, if you're trying to convince a marketing team that they need to do something more securely, showing how other marketing teams have been impacted, um, either whether it's by social engineering or phishing or some, you know, some tool that they're using that they didn't consider uh, the security ramifications for. All of that, I think, is important data to bring as you're trying to change the culture. Um, for engineers, I've seen that Find a find a security hole in their code and and show what you can do through a red team exercise, and all of a sudden you start seeing folks really realize w how what they're doing can have massive impact if if they're not taking security um, seriously and they're not taking that on as a responsibility. Uh, the other thing I've I've found that's been really fun actually um, and has worked really well in the past few companies is I like to make my executive team champions so i all the way from the ceo down right and um 
I, I take them and we make these funny videos where we make someone doing the wrong thing as it relates to security. And there's a few fo uh, folks from the executive team that'll come in and save the day. And we show that at our company all hands. And so quarterly, we'll make a video like that where a CEO or CFO or CMO are in the videos. It's become a part of the culture. People are waiting for the video every quarter. What is the security message going to be in <laughs> this quarter? Um, and it gets like thousands of um, just messages and people just love it. And it, it starts being something that people talk about, right? And uh, we're talking about security. And so I think there's a lot of things you can do around the culture. I think regular training, I think you, there's, there's two uh, schools of thought around incidents, right? Do hide incidents like we used to in the security team, like it's totally like you don't share with anybody, you keep it private, you keep it confidential, you're in a private room. But now we're starting to learn like, Yes, there might be certain incidents you just can't share uh, broadly, but there's a lot you can. And it, there's so many things to learn from that, right? Whether you take it to the board or the executive team or to the team that the incident impacted, um, I think being transparent and saying, like, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again is super important. That is very cool how you have the executives participate in those videos. When you were first describing it, I thought you were going to say that it was the executives that did uh, you tape them doing something wrong or making a mistake, but yeah, it makes sense to have them come in and be the example of kind of saving the day and fixing the fixing the problem. There's that element of that executive peer pressure, right? Of, oh, well, if somebody else, if senior leadership is doing it, then we've got to do it too. You know, that's, that's a really great example. Yeah, I was just in the elevator and like, you know, someone didn't badge in, someone said, hey, you need to go and make sure you badge in. And it's all part of like that cam campaign. Maybe that's because I was in the elevator, but it's there is that culture of people, you know, holding others accountable. Yeah, great. Now, you know, you mentioned kind of your long history across uh, various companies and various industries. You know, you've been in the energy sector, the retail sector, some of the largest technology companies, financial services, security companies, and so on. And, you know, related to, I guess, that that culture and that mindset, but also just curious, are there any notable commonalities or differences that you've seen between the security programs at these different places based upon the business and the industry? Yeah, there's so a lot of like the principles that we run by as security practitioners, they don't change right from company to company. They're pretty much the same. I think what's changed is a couple of things now having done this for 20 years. The world is different and <laughs> like so different how we thought about security like there were no CISOs there I don't even rem I don't remember hearing the CISO title until about five years into my career um, and and I think eBay was one of the first um, non-banking companies that had a CISO back then so it's things have changed drastically I think time has been a big thing um, in seeing change but like, for example, how private companies run security is very different than how public companies do. There's usually private companies are focused on let's get a product out the door, prove that we can generate revenue and that there's a customer demand. And so security, although they're starting to think about it and have to, it's not maybe the highest investment area and it may be something that's lagging, whereas like there's now you're in utility this day and age or fi fintech it's highly regulated right there's so many regulations um around financial transactions and so forth and so that makes it very different a lot more scrutiny around security a lot more audits that you go through um and so that's been a little bit of a learning that maybe my governance risk compliance team was very small at one company but now at a company where you get going through bank audits and things like that on a very regular basis, your team may be larger. So um, I think that there is definitely difference between industries. There's difference in culture. Um, there's difference in kind of like the championship level and understanding of every company when you join um, and where their state of security is. So you kind of have to assess that and then come up with your game plan on how am I going to go attack this and how are we going to build the strategy here? Um, but it is quite different. But I would say like the principles have been the same. Like whether I go from this company, I care about identity and access management. You have to get that right. You've got to be on that zero trust journey. So there's some basic things that always remain the same. I think to what maturity level do you take the company? To what degree of scrutiny is there on your controls that changes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how you frame that in terms of, hey, there are things that don't change that stay the same in terms of perhaps those first principles of security and really having that grounding in terms of what, what needs to be done on a day to day basis but tying that back and, and adapting that to the culture and the organization and the industry, hey, that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, um, we mentioned a couple times kind of mentorship here, and I get this question a lot from various folks at different stages of their career, both early on and even people that are further on in their careers is kind of how do they take the next step? 
in their career. And I think, you know, you're, you're a shining example of that in terms of kind of taking the next step at various points. How do you go about finding uh, a mentor? You know, what has worked for you from a mentorship perspective? You know, also, you know, have you ever had a, a sponsor, right, that has kind of been able to connect you with some of these different opportunities? Uh, totally. And and I think mentors, I think people think that mentors have to come in a certain size or form or something like that, meaning that they have to have a certain title for you to go in. And, and you know, I think one of the biggest things for you to realize is that I didn't realize it actually in the moment. It was later that I realized that, this person at Walmart was my mentor. <laughs> They'd taken me under uh, their wings and said like, Rinky, I'm just going to teach you. I don't know why. I still to this day don't know why. Maybe they were interested in getting more more people into cybersecurity, make sure people don't leave. I don't know what it was, but he took me under his wings. And I realized later that that was a mentor of mine and he was a peer of mine that just taught me things. I think understanding mentors can come, sometimes they can be bosses, sometimes they can be people in different teams. You might already have a mentor, but recognizing that, is really important and you don't necessarily need to formalize it but i think a lot of times they can be your peers sometimes they can even be someone that reports to you like it could be anybody and i think men what you need um at any point changes and there may not be one mentor that can help you in every area as you grow your career you may need a different kind of mentor or you may need a very specific mentorship uh, for some specific thing you're trying to accomplish and so that changes early on for me it was like how do I navigate politics and and how do I navigate like, you know, uh, leadership and how, or how do I influence the culture of a company? Later, it changed into I got myself into a sticky situation on and now I don't know which board position to choose. And so I'm looking for somebody who might have been in a similar situation to guide me. And so I think it changes um, from from place to place. And for me, it's I've been fortunate that I've found mentors in the companies I've been working at and, you know, have latched on to that. And I'm not a great, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not super good at keeping in touch with people, <laughs> but I'm, but I think it's important. Like, I'll just, I'll reach out to the person and I'm like, I need help on this thing. And I'd be surprised at how giving people are with their time. Um, and then I have had sponsors too, right? Like I had someone who is a peer of mine um, at Palo Alto Networks who introduced me to the board position at Fordrock, as an example, or a person that's who, who um, you know, I worked at a prior company with who always reaches out and says, Rinky, I thought of you for this opportunity and considered some of these folks as like massive sponsors, you know, uh, of me and uh, of my career. Yeah, that's great. You know, the, uh, the the key thing I took away from what you were saying is just being open to the opportunity, being open to accepting the the help there and kind of putting yourself out there a little bit in that way. You know, you mentioned uh, the couple of board roles. And I think uh, when I talked to different folks in the security industry, different security leaders, different people at different points of their career, one of the common things that often comes up is they want to try to figure out how to potentially uh, get some board roles in the future, whether it be a publicly traded company or a privately traded one. You give a little bit of a hint as to how that opportunity with Fordrock came about, but can you go into a little bit more detail about you know your journey in terms of looking for those roles and what that entails? Yeah, I think the what I've realized is, and and this is very my personal um, my personal experience, and maybe different than what others have faced. I tried everything, Frank. Like I tried to go and I I I started by advising startups. I started networking with the VCs, all in the hopes of. I want a board position, right? So started advising startups thinking that would lead to it. I started advising VCs hoping that would would take any VC call to take feedback on products, right? That didn't work. And so then I went through this um, uh, board coaching type program for women. Um, that totally didn't work. And they're, they're supposed to match you to a board position. And for me, I felt like that board coaching program was changing my voice, changing mm -hmm. who I authentically was. And it didn't work for me. And it actually frustrated me and almost made me feel like if this is what it is to do a board position, then I'm not sure that it's for me. Um, and so that didn't, that didn't work for me. And what I realized is like, in order to like, you need, like, especially in, I think women need board positions to get experience being board members. And I think people in general, even CISOs need board positions to get that experience. Um, and what I realized is as my network grew, as I worked at these different companies, my network is what's gotten me both the board positions I'm on. My, my, it was somebody I worked with at Palo Alto Networks who is at Ford Drug now. She was like, we're 
expanding our board now that we're planning on going public a few years ago. Rink, Rinky, can you meet our CEO? And this might, let's see if this works out. And it did, right? And and with um, with Vault Tree, it was the same thing. It came through my network. It was a CISO that I had networked with who's on a bunch of boards and invests himself that said, Rinky, this is a great one for you to come and join if you're open to it. And so that's kind of how those board positions happen. It's kind of been through my network. Um, and I think there were a lot of things that prepared me for it too. I think advising companies, startups really helped me understand financials and a lot of things that I don't have on the day-to-day CISO. And then I learned a lot in the boardroom and from my peers in the, in the boardroom as well, um, you know, to make me a better public, uh, uh, public company board member. Mm-hmm. Great, you know, really points to the importance of building those relationships and cultivating those over time. That that is great. Uh, you know, earlier you also mentioned, you know, having the to make a decision between a couple different board roles or maybe different seats on the the same board. What can you go into a little bit of detail? What were those opportunities, and you know, why did you just pick one over the other? Um, I, I so at the time when I was selecting uh, board positions, um, there was a company that I got involved with that was with an activist investor. I was so like I wanted to be on a board at that point, um, and as that as that progressed and the interviews and all that, there's a a lot of process that goes into an activist board nomination, um, board member nomination. And I kind of started understanding it and like realizing this is not for me through the middle of the process where it was kind of a little late. Um, and I had to get advice on what do I do now? Cause I'm going to break relationships and probably end up in a bad place. And I needed, this is where I needed mentorship. And maybe that product is a little bit, competitive to another company that I was interviewing for. Um, it all worked out in the end. I like, and, and, you know, I, I backed out of the other one. I ended up taking the ones I did. Um, but that you don't, you can't, you don't know how to navigate that until you get into the situation. Then you need to talk to somebody that's been through it. And fortunately I got some really good advice where it was like, okay, let's just break down this problem and talk through it in like logical steps. And here's, it landed in a place and I knew exactly what I needed to go and do and which company I wanted to be on the board for. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's really important as you're selecting a board. Um, I was, I'm really lucky. I got the Ford Rock experience. I think is gonna be a hard one to beat. Like the board members are just amazing. It's a highly, um, it's just a great team and it's a great CEO. And so I think that that's gonna be a hard one to beat. I think knowing that you're these are this is a company you believe in, a CEO you believe in, a board group that you want to work with, and they're gonna be supportive, especially if it's a first board position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, Fortrock may be a little bit unique in the sense that it is a you know technology vendor. It's in the security space, focused on identity and access management. Now, you know, I know that uh, most boards they don't t- tend to focus on security specifically. They might not always have a technology background. You know, what have you found is the the level of knowledge at the board level about cybersecurity, and then really how do you frame those those security items around more so business risks to make things understandable to the board? Yeah. Are you talking about, Frank, me being a CISO presenting to a board or me as a CISO being on a board? Yeah, great clarification. I think both. Maybe if we can take it first as the, the CISO, which I think a lot of our uh, listeners will uh, will resonate with. Yeah, I think with with pre- me as a CISO presenting to my, like the boards that I've presented to, I've realized a couple things. One, board members have varying knowledges, uh, varying knowledge of um, cybersecurity. So you kind of have to baseline that, which means you have to have a one-on-one relationship with the board members. Uh, most CISOs like present to an audit committee or maybe a risk committee of some sort. Now, more and more, there's cybersecurity committees that are forming um, where I think they are bringing in cybersecurity expertise into the committee as well. Um, but I think baselining that, I think getting an understanding of what is it that you want to share with the board? What is it that the board members want as well? And making it an active dialogue where it's not just a presentation. Um, I think those things have proven really well for me. I think making sure that they understand here are the risks that you're tracking. Here's how you're mitigating those risks. Here are the programs you have in place. And then how ready are you if you were to have a breach? And how are you going to handle that? And what's the readiness level? Um, and how do you practice that? And that's really important um, as well. And then finally, like I think it's... It, it, it's like you have to have that conversation with Rinky, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> and hopefully the board members are having that dialogue. It's not just about the metrics and the data presented in the deck, but you're having this very active dialogue. And I think that's really important. Um, me as a CISO in the boardroom, 
Um, I, you know, it's hard for me. I'm I, both the boards I'm part of are like security or security adjacent companies. And so they're like very, they're very security minded. Everybody understands the security space pretty well. Um, but what I do do is I have an active relationship with the CISOs, at, you know, at those companies. And I have I very regularly talk to them, understand kind of what they're worried about inside the boardroom, outside the boardroom as well. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of times I'm that voice that will ask a lot of questions when the topic is cybersecurity at, in the boardroom. Um, and folks will ask like, hey, Rinky, like, how do you see this? Give us a better, better understanding. And a lot of times I'll do that in the boardroom. A lot of times it's the uh, CISO that's doing that of the company. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, that's some great insight from both sides of the table as the CISO presenting to the board and being on the board itself. Now, uh, switching switching topics here a little bit back to you know some of the security specific capabilities. Kind of as you're thinking about continuing to grow and mature your program, what are you most excited about in cloud security and cybersecurity overall? Whether it be capabilities, tools, techniques, or things that your team is planning for. Yeah, I'm. What I'm excited about is like I've been at like when when you think about security and you take over kind of a program, you it could be one of many things, right? One, you're building from scratch, which is super fun. Sometimes you're taking something and you've just got to completely transform it. Sometimes it's scaling, um, and we're at a point where like we've got an amazing team. How do we scale the program? How do we um, how do we make sure that we're ready for the growth of the company of Bill? Like Bill is a beast, and I want to see it be a rocket ship. And how do we make sure that security is scaling with that? growth um how to, and you know a lot of how do we learn from the things that we've done either well or not well and continue to improve that and i think that's what i'm most excited about um i i continue to be so impressed by the startup um to security startups that are popping up and i think we have a team that's very excited about innovation so how can we like are there some little players out there that are gonna like you know really compete against some of the big ones that are out there in certain areas where we still need innovation right uh, we talk a lot about zero trust there's still so much i think room for innovation in that space and so how do we go and um create room to go and uh innovate and test out some of these products those are the things I'm most excited about. Um, the other I have to, like, I, I'm i more and more impressed with the, I think we're still slow, but I've, I've seen in my career, the improvement in diversity in cybersecurity. I'm like, my team is, um, you know, really proud to say that we've got a really we've got really good representation um, in our team. I hope to continue that. I hope to continue to see where it was 5%. We've seen 10%, now close to 20% women. And so I'm hoping that we continue to see not just more women in, in the space, but just more diversity as whole. And I'm really excited about that. We need that in this space. I want to circle back to what you mentioned about the startups in a moment. But for now, you know, I want to zoom in a little bit more on the, the diversity aspect. You know, you've mentioned kind of being able to, to grow the representation on the team from a women and minority perspective. What what is what has worked to do that? You know, because that's uh, that's hard unless you put focused kind of thought and effort behind it. You know, it doesn't just happen by itself. You know, what have you found that's uh, made a difference? I think you start with your leadership team, like you start with making sure that's you know, a, a, a diverse group. And when you start thinking right from the beginning of building in, um, or even if you're transforming that, if you want di you, when you, when you think about diversity, you bring in diverse folks, they bring in more diverse folks and it just becomes a team and it's natural at that point. And I think that's been a huge focus. I think how we recruit, um, ma making sure that your recruiting process is, is, going to recruit diverse talent, that you're not just going to get the same kind of folks because your job descriptions aren't right, or you're not, you're looking at the same schools, or you're not opening up to looking at different kinds of degrees. And so I think it's really important to look at all of it. But I think it also, it's like, it's a mindset that starts with the leadership team. Um, because at the, if you set that from the get go, then I think you start building that uh, down below. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Now, uh, circling back in terms of the startups, for me, you know, most of my career, let's say 80% has been at large companies, large enterprises, 20% has been at smaller companies. And I've typically found that in large companies, it's, you know, we've got the, the big established vendors or products that we might use. There's that old saying that nobody gets fired for buying IBM. And it's kind of perhaps becoming nowadays, maybe nobody gets fired for buying Microsoft nowadays. And, uh, and so I, I mentioned that here because you know, it was always hard in the past for me at these large enterprises to um, buy the cutting edge, the, the latest and greatest uh, startups, the very small companies, because we factor in, you know, what's the viability of the company, how big are they, and so on. So I always tried to allocate 
eh, 10, 15, eh, it's depending on the place, upwards of 20% of my portfolio to certain smaller bets that, you know, hey, maybe in three years, we're going to move on to something else. Maybe in a couple of years, we'll move on to something else. How are you? But one of the challenges that I had is that, you know, my team, they're overwhelmed in the day to day. And uh, they, you know, while they're interested in new technologies, they didn't necessarily want to take time to start to play with practice and operationalize something else. You know, how did you get their buy-in and how do you think about that from a portfolio management perspective? Yeah, there's a couple of things. I guess you don't want to become that CISO that's just like tossing every technology because we're excited about it. And I do do that sometimes and the team then pushes back saying, Rinky, this is too much. (laughs) Like... So I think it's important, like we need to tie whatever cool products that are out there, the new tech that's out there back to the business problems that we're trying to solve and back to the security risks that we're trying to mitigate. And I think when you do that, you'll find like, you know, some of the products that are existing large products, we have challenges with them. And so I think it's saying like, okay, are there things that we have that, yes, it would be a pain maybe to take it out, but maybe someone's doing it so well right now in a startup space that it could save us a ton of time, money. It might save us, it it might be a better experience altogether for our employees. And so that, I think having that mindset as you start evaluating, I think is important. I also think like um, incentivizing innovation in, within the team and incentivizing like when you do find a startup that's doing something way better or a startup that's solving something that you didn't solve and the team kind of spends time to do that. You have to incentivize that in the right way that people do want to do that. Um, and then, yes, they should have the way to see, speak up to say we're not able to focus on what we need to do because there's too much of this noise and then you've got to give them the time to do that. Um, but I think as you scale the team, you get more bandwidth to do some of this stuff. And I think you have to make sure that you're hiring people that care to innovate and care to go and look into some of these new technologies. Yeah, great. It's really, you know, you mentioned, uh, it's basically the what's in it for me, what's in it for the business, but also what's in it for your team member, what's in it for the engineer, what's in it for the the uh, administrator in terms of making that switch or adopting something new. So yeah, that's goes back to the, the mindset and the culture and, you know, like you said, the, the incentives associated with it. So yeah, that's uh, really nicely put. The, uh, Ricky, I want to go ahead and switch things up uh, a little bit here, give you an opportunity, if you have any, uh, to ask me a question, a little bit of a reverso around here. I do. Yeah, because you're 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 a CISO. You're um, with uh, you did the investment um, uh, gig for a while, like a VC gig. Like what's life after? Like, what what are we going to do after being a CISO? Like, what do you see as that career path? Because I've been like folks ask me, I don't have a clean answer, but like they're like, okay, you've reached CISO. What do you do after that? And now we've seen some people take on CT, like some really, like, it's been like inspirational to see some CISOs take on CTO roles. Um, But like, what is, what do CISOs do after? Yeah, that is a really good question. And, you know, this is the first time I'm hearing it. You know, we didn't kind of prep for this question. So, you know, I'm a little bit at a loss for words, partly because it's also a personal journey, right? That I'm continuously trying to go on and figure out along the way. And, you know, for me, I feel a little bit lucky, you know, as you know, I've been in this like yourself for over 20 years here, a couple decades. And uh, many years ago, you know, I started teaching for uh, with SANS and, uh, you know, I didn't know where that would necessarily lead. But, you know, fast forward to today, you know, had been had the uh, the honor of being more involved in SANS and kind of working on some of the curriculum, the cloud curriculum and the leadership curriculum. And I remember some years ago, I had a and an interview for a CISO gig that, you know, it, uh, I didn't wind up taking it. It didn't wind, work out for various reasons. But one of the questions that really stuck out to me was uh, they said, hey, so Frank, you know, if you're not doing this, what is it that you would want to be doing? And I didn't have the answer right at that moment. But after reflecting upon it, I would say, well, hey, I would just be teaching more and I would be trying to help others in there at various points of their career journey. And uh, so really, that's a long way of me saying that, hey, I really love what I'm doing in the sense of kind of teaching and consulting. And then, like you mentioned, you know, being involved in the venture world and helping startups and young entrepreneurs on their journey. Right. And trying to help them uh, on their path to uh, to building uh, capabilities that will help the industry as a whole and, you know, specific customers uh, uh, problems. So broadly speaking, you know, for me, that's kind of what it what it is, you know, kind of teaching and advising and, you know, doing a little bit of uh, investing. And I'm still really, uh, you know, loving it, loving that. And so, yeah, I see uh, other CISOs, like you said, they take on, they think about, well, there are some career CISOs in terms of they go from CISO gig to CISO gig kind of until retirement, but others that take on like yourself, 
board opportunities and take on other other roles. But for me right now, who knows what two, three years will bring. But uh, yeah, you know, I think that's where that's where I'm at right now, Miki. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for answering that. I think it's going to be helpful to a lot of us that are listening out there. Yeah. Now, you know, hey, you know, you've also got uh, this journey that you've been on. And I guess, you know, maybe if I can, I'll ask the same question back to you. You know, I mean, after being a multi-time CISO, having such a long journey in security and, you know, having different board roles, kind of what, what do you think about? I, it's it's interesting because I feel like I could go so many paths still. I, um, I could stay CISO so that, you know, that can, you know, I love my gig right now. And so that's obviously one thing. But if I think like five to 10 years out, I could also see myself owning my own security company. I could see myself consulting. I could see myself maybe just doing board and advisory roles. I just like, and I, that's why I'm like, I'm not sure what I'm going to, I don't know. Right. And so, and I see these amazing CISOs that have taken on CTO roles. That sounds interesting. So I feel like it's, there's so many possibilities, um, you know, and, uh, but right now I'm really enjoying kind of advising and doing the board and doing being CISO at here at Bill. And so I'm really enjoying it, but yeah, I, I think there's, uh, I, I think about it like well, 10 years from now, where, where will I be? And I think it could be any of those paths. Great. Well, hey, Rinky, I think that is about as perfect of a place to uh, to end the show here as we can get. Uh, Rinky, thank you so much for joining and sharing your experiences and your insights and your overall journey. I think people will get a lot out of this uh, episode. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Frank. This was fun.